your father and child, I kind of bring back this memory of bonding with my father as a way of using this process to kind of grieve and, and reflecting on this moment in my life, well, with all sorts of memories and nostalgia, leaving me longing for a relationship I don't want to have. Grappling with death conceptually, I found myself creating death into a character. Like here, death is kind of hostile, lunging at the unsuspecting person. It's almost indifferent from Lockman's routine. That grief hanging around can be numbing, but also that death can come at any time. Then I went from that to depicting death as lackadaisical. In the vein of humor, I wanted to humanize death and death as a smoker, showing him kind of just like someone on their smoke break after a long day of playing the souls of the living. And going through and thinking about death and the passage of time and how we age and how we over time. And all of that brings me to question things about visualizing the spirit of spirits and the afterlife. And then I, you know, I start to begin to depict living people with these spirits, like here I have my you know, I felt the creative soul of my brother Alejandro, and I'm at, and you know creating this space of like these spirits starting to invade in a space where it's somewhat concrete, like what is happening all around us and how we are locked into this concrete and physical relationship. And thinking on current relationships, I you know think of my family a lot, and I think back to my mom. And I wanted to excavate this moment of tenderness. Alluding to methods of escapism by use of such for games like here with the game boy in the corner, drawings on the floor, and my mom reading to me, which is another escape. And, you know, through that other act of bonding, similar to how I'm bonding with my father. I think mean that in, in thinking on that and thinking about family, think about escapism, both physical and ways we do it. And then my family of this trip we had and this visualization that I was held on to since I was a child. I'm trying to reconnect to that childhood through that memory, through that visualization of the body. There's this trip going to this place in North Carolina called Walnut Island. And I always stuck with that. And I took this even when I was a kid or this person submerged in water. And that's that's where we're going to vacation from such like that. To touch into that kind of imagination of child, I, I want to always kind of rekindle in terms of like in the current. Way of thinking. And on that trip, I, I really bought and found a book for, for a game, specifically this game called Person of Zelda, Local of Seasons on, on the Game Boy. If you're not familiar with the Game Boy, you can use his directional pads and his buttons to interact with the character and interact with the world. And in that game, like, it opens with this green clad adventure, and this bright and kind of saturated colors so that I was trying, starting to like pull back from. And search to, to come out on that part of the screen, the blue, the red, the oranges, and all this kind of hyper colors, and video games, and cartoons, and part of that nostalgia. And I, I kind of like the slapstick comedy aspect of cartoons that I grew up with, and some games retain that cartoon quality. And it's something I'm going to utilize you know, to satire the world around me and, and kind of poke fun. But I also want to, with this. Working with the subject of video games, I wanted to stigmatize games as being uh, intellectual and encourage them to be seen as what some of them are, which is great works of art. But these are my myths that I grew up with, mystifying me about far off lands, legendary creatures, and the virtues of courage. I also use poetry as a part of my process, kind of reflect on my work. When I finish the work and keep it in here, I'm starting to integrate language. How I would break the whole the rhymes and stuff like that into the picture. And I use that process of poetry as a way to reflect on my imagery and kind of always ask myself and reinterpret and reread my image and kind of start to wow and clarify what I'm trying to convey. So, through my process, I'm, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, but I see a lot of these as an extension of drawing. So a lot of my process is always rooted in drawing. And I use it as a method of gathering image and working out composition. It's very immediate. And you know, I I like to see how I can transfer that. And when I do to a, for example, a ceramic pattern, I'm saying, oh, what can I draw? 
that is going that solely that's making the fact that they can So tying the image to that is very fascinating. And I see John also as an extension of my consciousness. I start with like a doodling like process, more academic term would be automatic form. It's similar to what writers have used, which is called stream of consciousness, right? With that kind of mental shift allowing them to better access the subconscious and let things just spill out, just follow, and just word after word, and just like how I try to approach that. Oh, this is this. I'm remembering this thing. Let me resurrect that. Just really work through it and not get too caught up over conceptualizing them. It's just embrace the process, let the process itself be thinking. That knots around the imagery, like the jazz piano is going up and down the keys. And I embrace that improvisational nature of drawing, making art. It really allows me to, you know. I get lost in that process and I, I find things and I excavate things about my personal history through these physical processes as opposed to conceptualizing it and bringing it to that process. I'll also use book finding as a, as, a, as a way of collecting all these drawings, as a way of like transforming all this imagery that would naturally just let spill out of myself and kind of transform it into this object. And have this aura about it. And I like that, you know, I've always been an avid sketchbooker. So I've always used sketchbooks as that drawing process as a way to enter in very easily, just immediately. Just okay, I don't have to worry too much. It's, it's low stakes, you know, like I can just really get in there and you know, work things out, whatever I'm dealing with at the time. So whatever vision comes to my head, and I need to get down quickly. And I build up that imagery and then I start to fold it, fold it, fold it, and build it and through pagination, which is a process of bookbinding where you're deciding the order of how image, images work. That process itself also acts as another step to kind of slow me down and think about my images and think about what, what, what is this all out of like? And what can I pull from it? What can I, you know, I can then once it's bound. I kind of have it as this kind of seal that I have it for later. I can reaccess this as mine. And I can really, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, as a presentation on all of that, growing up with a bunch of books and picture books and looking for picture books, it's, it's another way for me to, you know, reintroduce or, or bring my world, bring my art, my worldview back into the world in a way that I kind of like. So the style <clears throat> And then I'm also coming over to ceramics at the same time. And I let myself, I find myself loosening up with mark making, thinking about different ways of approaching my image making. For example, like reduction. I can cut away the surface and reveal the line underneath as opposed to adding, adding the processes and, sub, and subtracting processes and thinking about, well, when can I do this and when can I do that? How does that work as design tools for me to build a more successful image? And then I can take that over using the mason stains, the broad kind of goat hair brushes and ceramics. I can take that over to my ink drawing and just introduce that same kind of gesture, just like Japanese ceramics, kind of have that splash of splash of clay, splash of uh, underglaze, calligraphic mark <clears throat> In this minor condition, I have a current depiction of myself and following that theme of family. And I'm using the sword symbolically to represent tradition. And also tradition as like myself as an artist and myself as a person and what's being handed down to me from my family. And that those things are double-sided of tradition. There are parts that I want to keep, but there are parts that I think should be challenged and changed. Just like in art, there are things that should be challenged, conventions should be challenged, I think that. But there's also aspects like Going back to thinking about these and thinking about red figure bases from Greece and stuff like that, and embracing those aspects of, of tradition, but then reinventing it for the time time that we, or re reappropriating it for the time that we. And at the same time, working on the ceramic platters, I was specifically starting to engage in video game drawings and bringing some of that imagery. So naturally, I brought that imagery into ceramics. And use this process as another way to physically work through my ideas. 
And I end up taking split influences with Mediterranean ancient ceramics and blending it with my zone inspired landscapes. And cutting into that play really reminded me of the, of the ground, feeling the pop from underneath. So going, so then I'm also going over its edge and using that as another extension, a very direct kind of extension of my of drawing, but it adds like an element that makes you slow down. Or I really have to take my time before I put this in the mass of that. I can get, you know, it gives me, you know, from that drawing, which is very rapid and immediate, all these processes, there are some processes like this or world that sort of slow you down and change how you approach your imagery, how you consider things. And you can't end, I then, for etching, I just love working so intimately. And, and the needle, you can get like, you can get more precision than the finest pen. But at the same time, there's a wrongness because of that physicality of the copper clay. I'm going through the same etching process, the goal of asking myself, how do I create a concept? Specifically, thinking about this kind of subconscious realm and, and, and how we, you know, how we address that, how we visualize the, the that more primal aspect of our psyche, which is the conscious or the unconscious, the, un, the sleeping mind or the unwake or the waking mind, right? And I wanted to draw through that process and taking from Carl Young's counter for shadow, we're talking about, you know, coming down to the depths of that primal, you know, the rational mind meeting with the unrational mind and it's and seeing that and building your morality from there, right? So, and, and using, and then starting to use color in my etching process helped me figure out, you know, color and bring color into my little painting as I was bringing the bottom of these images from that channel into my studio and then I okay, okay, it just happens all worked out. I'll just start painting that and not worry about having to come up with an image to practice that work. And even this place that I was that I was starting to do painting starts to communicate with how I want to present my work and how I want to show my work together. Then you need to inform each other. Like I said, I think my image from Edges and I'm going to go kind of like the proofread I'd say, well, you know, you can solve it and I can refine it and take it away, see so what works, see so what doesn't work, and then iterate on it and see how it, you know, see how I can elevate it further past that original idea. And I attempt to use that, uh, use that advantage of the oil painting to create an atmosphere, create this kind of shadow place to have this. I then start attempting more direct pain. Okay, I'm going to work out my image and directly draw, work out something there to, to then balance how I'm approaching it. That now I'm approaching it the same way as I'm like taking risks and trying different ways of approaching each process directly or from another image or being inspired by other processes. And then I started to use this commonality in the work of this green room and using different scale, scale dynamics among my blue spirits and bigger. Then the automatic drawing starts to come over into my painting as well. And I start to do these ones where I'm just kind of responding, just you know, kind of doing that improvisation of let me just start a face here and then come over here and build a structure to go like the city out, like not a look up. Kind of just like an amalgamation of culture of people and building. Kind of just like to make a map of the very economic as opposed to me getting out of my every little thing, making more of an abstract picture. And then and even further moving into this idea of taking out the moving out the green room and showing the world outside. You know, compared to maybe this more claustrophobic, kind of like how we are feeling right now. Some claustrophobic, we have all these people out in crowds, like madness outside. And with all this smaller work that I was 
just kind of know that I was really developing a I was thinking, well, I want to take these and create a, a larger whole out of them. Make kind of like a way to organize this chaos and kind of result and make more, you know, make it a sum of sum of the whole out of all this and, and find ones that are really bleeding together. And it, it went through several iterations. And I had really, you know, begun to try different things out, try different layouts out. I was just working in the design, I was just working out narrative, I was just working out conceptual with, with the ideas that I'm already working with and that I'm already presenting. And then I arrive at this one that at the same time it becomes like a green robot, like I'm like fun, like I'm going back to that childhood. Sometimes I even call it my inner child, it's my inner child. And, and, but at the same time, it becomes almost like an altar. It's like, it's a way to exalt my memories and my nostalgias in a, in a significant way to me personally. And then for my influences, I, I found myself very inspired by Paul Klein because it was very romantic pictures. Because in my work, I went to romanticize my work. I romanticize, go back to like poetry and his games and his stories and his myths. And that's how I kind of want to present the world in this kind of more constructive way and, and really break it down and put it back together in different ways through color, through line, through design, through symbols. I began even just trying this out at myself, this one by Paul Clay, trying this kind of way of working through color as an exercise for myself because I found myself saying to myself, well, I don't really feel like I know how to use color. So just break it down and keep it simple. Just color makes it color makes it color and kind of they interact and kind of they communicate to one to over here because that's what painting at its core is color communication with color. And then I even start to take that and blend it with the automatic drawing where I kind of just block in, or now it's automatic painting. And I'm letting that sit. And then I then kind of reinterpret into the open shapes that same kind of process and pulling from those same kind of areas of nostalgia, memory, so like games or characters, magic and books and mystifying the world. And Kind of in a way, trying to take some of these things I'm learning from the artists that I'm inspired by and taking them for my own and, and building my own kind of way of constructing the image, my own visual language, my own lexicon to communicate to the world. Another artist that I was very inspired by was James Enzer, and especially when I was starting to work into the oil painting, I was, I was, I was struggling a bit to find ways that I'm more expressive towards them more. I want a lot of pain, I want a lot of motion and energy, kind of like Van Gogh, kind of like answer. And I was finding the power up, I did up a bunch of figures. I put, I make these drawings with all these figures. And, and an artist I found similar to that was James Anzer. Seeing how he was working with the paint and this kind of white canceling out all of his color in the central form. So that was starting to do, and I was like, oh, okay, I can introduce that into these green rooms. And just kind of silence it by like kind of lighting that green a little bit and then working into the figures. And I found this was a real breakthrough piece from me in my oil paint that I really found myself elevating. And I said, oh, you know, now, now I feel like I know how to paint. Now I feel like this is starting to put. And I bring these phantoms into our time. I place some more reads recently at night with the phone charge or put them to the wall, and adding an additional portal to the window and the picture frame. The mirror, my own way to explore the same kind of similar that he is distorting the figure and keeping the visage in his painting. Another one of his that I just try to composition out myself, you know, just to see how we work through it as a way to like, okay, this is a jumping off point, not necessarily to just copy the artist, but try out a composition in the same way that it's kind of working with me and those. Way I'm doing those flat kind of perspectives. And I was like, okay, I'm trying to bring that into my world and use it as an exercise to further push my pain. Another artist that 
at the time that I was starting to become really looking into was also this uh, Jim Nunn, and he was part of this group in, in Chicago called the Harry, six artists from Chicago, and they all are alumni of the Chicago Art Institute. And they were really exploring like their kind of pop culture. I, know that I remember reading about Jim Nunn talking about he was doing a lot of these reverse glass paintings, and he's taking a lot of that inspiration from just like I was playing a lot of pinball at the time. Involved, seeing how that they were making images onto that surface, I just wanted to copy that, and replicate that, and I found that kind of resonating with me with my love for video games and trying to bring some of those perspectives and different ways of visual re visually representing a world into my own work. And I've also taken a lot of inspiration from reading, you know, reading just stories and stuff like. For example, I just take this kind of mess of paranoia from uh, Franz Kafka's The Cast in the first chapter, try to explore what I, how do I visualize what I read, all this language and all this thing that I need to interpret. It's, it's swirling up in my imagination, making me think of things that I can start to express. And how do I do that vision? How do I break down this moment and compress time and compress that? All, all these events that I have read about and make it make an interesting image out of that impression. I would place it in design too. And continuing on Kafka, thinking about kind of this stuck state of like being so confined in your room and stuff like that, that we've all kind of been dealing with <clears throat> that kind of same story that I, you know, always read and, and I found it so funny, but at the same time, it is that uh, the condition of like burnout, of, like being overworked, not enjoying getting up at 6 a.m., you know, and just wanting to just stay, you know, just that transformation into realization that, you know, everything is so absurd, but why get up? Just turn into a book. And even from taking inspiration from the large history of art, like I like to take from ancient art, like this is a, this painting I was taking inspiration from this kind of these sidelines, these deities from ancient Mesopotamian carvings, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and using that as another visual matrix to reinterpret my time, different ways to kind of create a space. If I want to make a temple, use that kind of as a jumping off point to make an image. I'm working more into that, thinking about the visualization of the spirit and another jumping off point from our history using Boyle's Tower of Bad Up, but thinking about what's, what's above the clouds. What if they got up there? What would be trying to ask these questions visually and, and rework that? I sort of rework that and build a communication with our history and continue to ask my own questions with it. And, I, and then looking at paintings like this, and then going to my video, you know, going back to my video games and seeing this macro view of people kind of starts to inform me, even in this, and how I want to kind of make a constructive world. How do I show everything at once? But also, sometimes, how do I do that more gracefully, design wise, instead of just jamming everything in there? Uh, and then, macro view six is me for nostalgia on video game. Overworlds like in Zelda to embrace my nostalgia, the abstractions of, of this world map, and my colors that echo out from here in my nostalgia, reflecting on my past and childhood in this body of work. And so, moving forward, um, good. I want to continue asking questions about the digital age through imagery and process. And I would like to you know, move forward and teach because I want to share my passion. I think that. You know, I really enjoy just helping people out and getting people excited about the things that I'm excited about. And I learned a great deal in my time, and like how to research and how to be professional and how to better discipline myself in my practice to be organized. That is that the idea of a messy painter is not necessarily a great idea, but more efficient if you see all the things you use up on the wall and just taking account of my 
practice and, and really, you know, holding myself accountable for my professional side of my practice and my art side of my practice and, and refining that. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Now we're going to uh, the committee. We're going to just ask questions. Um, we also have a committee member in Zoom, too. So we're just going to ask questions now. Once we've completed that, then we'll offer the audience a chance to ask you questions. Okay. Um, let's see. I thought that one of, one of the things that was striking to me was your use of poetry. And you talk briefly about it. Can you elaborate on how you use poetry to perhaps construct your works? Well, I, I find that like it's like when you think about I think about design similarly to similarly like if you think about a poet and how a poet writes a poem. And if you get into that, that way of thinking, precision, right? It's, it's this work is deliberate, right? And, and, and I want to convey that as a way of mode of thinking as I'm using symbols in the work. I don't want to start, and I start to learn that more sort of painting was that I don't I have to have these focal points and I have to have really precision. And, and what makes or breaks it is that, like, even if it's just like a, an inch too low or an inch. Like that, that right now placement which is like so similar to how, how a poet might write like a haiku. You would pay attention to the solos. And the solos, even if there's a pause, there's a pause uses the solo for that as power. The same way if it, and it's even similar to extend also to music, but you know, a, a break in the in the notes is just as beautiful as the notes, right? And just as beautiful as that line. Of music, so I just I want to take like taking from also other ways of thinking. It's not just like the other processes. It's also find those other ways of thinking. You can learn from different ways to go to the or go write a poem. It's a different way of thinking, but but it translates something. So. Okay, <laughs> so you gave us three artists in the presentation that. You have referenced and you did a good job sort of referencing the formal aspects that you're taking influence of. Yeah. Um, but I'd like to hear more about other ways you have influence from them. And I'll follow up with that with if you were in a group exhibition, you call play James Ends or Jim Nutt, why would you be distinctive from them? Why would I be distinctive from Why or how? I, I think from my embracing, I think what I'm, I'm just starting to take different visual modes that they would not have access to, I guess. So just that way of thinking and how I'm leaving my work and my time is reflected in and trying to communicate with the time I'm living in, but also bridge these gaps of our history. Similarly, I feel that these artists are trying to do by making these paintings and this kind of lab of momentum worries like. Things that it has immortality, or the mind of mortality goes back, you know, forever, right? And also, I, some ways that I found myself somewhere like looking into Paul Clay's life, that he spent a lot of time with the kid. He spent a lot of time in his, in his marriage with the kid, like he took care of the kid primarily. So he was starting to see, like, the kid develop conscious of, oh, you just can make a picture of her. Like, he was just so abstract. Like, Take in, in, you know, starting to see if he's starting to take that applied to his work and almost trying to connect to that inner child. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do with some of these, you know, some of the images that I'm making in these memories I'm trying to act and you know, call back to. So I think just from where I'm coming from, from my experience, the experience that I'm going to convey is really what's going to, is going to set me apart, you know. More naturally, but I think more just how I'm starting to use color. It's kind of RBG, digital screen. So, so trying to capture that vibrancy at that, that age. Okay. 
So, uh, Professor Poindexter, if you could join us in um, voice chat or typing through Zoom chat. So, can you hear me right now? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So, um, my first question, Ryan, is how do you define auto automatic drawing in your practice? Other people have talked about it in different ways, but for you, what is automatic drawing? It, I, I kind of like calling it, it's like water. It's like going for like a walk. Like you don't you go for height and not like I'm going this way. I just kind of see what happens. I keep it that kind of open breathing process that it just kind of lets me so naturally and intuitively work through an idea. So for me, that automatism is kind of just like a way to unhinge from from overthinking, from from over conceptualizing. And it I, I just do see it like that. I think it'd be similar to picking up a guitar and fiddling, fiddling around, not, not trying to play a song, just trying to feel it out, feel out the process, and feel out and, and just embrace that process. Thank you. Good. Do I have a With that question, um, do you set any limits in that process? The only limit I set is that I, I only let myself run from imagination. So it's just to let it just purely come out of the That's the only kind of parameter. Sometimes I'll, I'll limit the tool, like the material, like just just pen, just pencil, just watercolor, like things like that to kind of just keep me focused. I have another. Okay. okay, Ryan, how has the video game experience changed from the past? to your present gaming experiences? And then, are you in some way beginning to create a metaverse? They, they've changed so much. They're, they're almost the, what's it called? The uncanny valley. They're so, they're so realistic. But then also they're so, they're so creative and, and using limits to their advantage. So it's kind of all over the place. Uh, it, 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 I think it's such an exciting thing to see is how those continue to evolve and continue to change with advances in technology. So, but it's also something that kind of is scary of ourselves. So, you know, the experience is becoming so entertaining that it could be more important than eating or, drink or drinking water, you know, like getting something into a, into a, into a universe and, and that's kind of just what I and that's what I was saying about this what's next to seeing all this stuff that's coming. It's, it's almost so chaotic and scary. And I think it's a wealth of things to start making images of. People getting locked up people getting you know, hooked up into virtual reality and all that kind of stuff and that separation from physical to the people around and stuff like that. I think moving forward I, I really do want to start to explore my work. So a couple of formal aspects, you, you gave us some good examples of some of your experimentation when you started grouping some of the works that we see here and up here. Um, so in terms of moving forward, um, how do you see arranging these works, you know, the, the multiplicity of that, because you do recognize them as individual works, and then you're bringing them together in the context of how you would exhibit them. Um, how do they function differently individually versus in these groups? I think my approach is that like making that, I'm starting to make them, obviously I'm starting to make them as individuals, but then over time I'm starting to see them and like, oh, well, I think I'm going to put the grid and I'm like, but that's, that's just not me. It's not me. I would try something different, right? And, and I wanted them to have power on their own each one to have power on their own, but also be able to, and I started to see, and I learned that, that if I approach it, and I started to approach it, you know, thinking ahead of how I want to install, how I want to, and, and bring that as a part of the process, ahead of how I want to frame this, is important, just as important as how I want to make this, because I, you know, I think considering that decision, so I had the time to help me make the presentation of it as unified to the body of work as possible. But with these gentlemen just working so much, working on them just so individually, I still wanted them to have power on them. So I wanted it to be something that can be viewed like 
from all the way over there, but also like this and have a similar kind of experience. I'll uh, kind of kind of tag on to that question a little bit too. And you know, so grouping also in book form. So you know, what is the importance of collecting drawings into a book form? Are you considering the sequence for which they are displayed, like in the gallery too? Yeah, and I, and I wanted, I, I have them for the exhibition. I had them center. And I had to face each other so you can kind of almost access all of them in the wall because I wanted to have that community kind of like, this is where some of the stuff starts to come from. It's just from this reputation and this keeping up this practice, keeping up this kind of drawing, the drawing, the working through your ideas as a visual drawing, you know, the visual way, right? So the presentation aspect, I do want to have that. I don't want to have that kind of, I don't want to face each other and have that kind of moment of like, you know, looking through a book with someone else and to kind of create a female aspect in the center. Yeah, we we'll, we should be sending some questions later. Okay. 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 So, well, I want to move on to the, uh, how do you compare working in the automatic with the fast pace of automatic drawing to then working in more slow paced mediums and do those inform each other? Yeah, I think that sometimes the sometimes the automatic can be I'm working too fast and then I'm not really letting myself dissolve an idea. But then the slowing down process really can be like I have to let each other to drop I mean, where I was and I have to think about it. My eyes out for 24 hours. So then coming back to the next day, I'm going to do it. One day older, so having that time to like in between sets and work and more responsive as opposed to that kind of just getting it out of the way that kind of works more for me in the drawing because I just want to look at the page and see what happens. And I can Uh, so based on the presentation today, you uh, you speak about your works much from sort of autobiographical approach. So what what kind of experience do you hope for your viewer if they don't know you and they don't know your stories? Well, I hope that through just like working through what I know and myself, that it can just be as authentic. As possible, and I find that you know, authenticity has been in the way. So that's why I believe that. Brian, Professor Poindexter asks Did you think about filling the space from top to bottom, side to side, to match the claustrophobia in many of your works? I you know, did, I did, but I don't think. In hindsight, I wrote I actually had enough. And what I said was that I did not, while I have a lot of artwork, it's not necessarily all polished across from where I am comfortable showing it. So I felt it would be a good, also a good practice to then also spend this kind of more reflective way and thinking into how I'm going to present my work and start to curate. And be like, okay, well, I want to just out of this time I had. Thank you. Do you, uh, Professor Brundish, do you have any more questions? I'm trying. Let me get my typing fingers going. So, just last quick question. Um, you know, you talked talk about you specifically said hyper colors, right? And yeah. You're connecting that to like the images you showed us at like Zelda. Right? Yeah. 
how do you feel about the idea that that color connection is definitely lost on some people? You know, that's a very particular moment in time. So, how do you kind of navigate that? I think kind of comparing, I try to, this one I'm trying to like pair it to the place where it's just on the street, you know, so make it more accessible to the people other generations might know. Or, you know but I think that that color has to be very important to me, and I'll be working forward and continue to make work in the line and go to my age at the point that there will be going to the gallery and stuff like that. So moving forward, time to work to start to build that communication with those two. Now I'm actually going to make a generalization to hear everyone say, you know, I'm on this. Professor Bordeshker asks that an automatic drawing system and painting system that you follow could imply an automated or subconscious installation process. Does that intrigue you? Have you experimented with that? No, I have, I'm not thought of that. I, I don't, I, I'm with that idea. I don't know if I have thought of that way. I guess I need to do that and bring work in and figure it out. It's like, you never know. I try to plan, but it's like, you can only plan so much. So um, I thought about drawing the walls, but I'm not, I'm not sold on the idea particularly yet. And it's not like a never, but I consider it written in just next to drawing and stuff like that. But um, I have not yet considered it. So, thank you. Another question from Professor Poindexter. How did you transcend your education in drawing? I kind of like, I didn't, so I used that basis that we get in drawing, and, and I, I just use it as like, okay, I got this concept now, it's just how I interpret how I like to get down to that at point. I kind of use it as a tool, like observational drawing, to if I need to know how to draw uh, anything, firefighter, I just go out a lot of times to know how to draw fire. Just use the skills to build up, like add to my canvas, and then also come back to another whole other person. But then I can add that fine ball, like all these fine weights and design decisions to inform how I'm going to draw. Thank you. That's pretty interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we need to wrap up our questions and just put them up to the audience. Keep them in the form of questions. If anybody on Zoom has questions, feel free to type them in. If anyone on Zoom has a question, please go ahead and type it into the chat. So, what can the extension of the people like that's important to you in like any of some of these uh, subjects that you have? Like, that, like I guess, like in your, in your child or something? Yeah, I think, I think it, it, it in a way of like kind of trying to rationalize the source, like even in, even in evidence, I'm like, trying to let them off the hook, like it's just doing the job. It's not, <laughs> it's not, you know, conversing. Like, I shouldn't have. And it kind of helps you work through even just like you know, you do a better idea of things like there are tools, but it does have that aspect to it. You work through things that you are emotional, and it really takes me a place. So, like, if I'm going through something, I, I just need to draw. Like, it's, it's a main expression that really helps me get to do something. And I get out, I'm just whatever, you know, I feel like it helps you emotionally stabilize some ground. And so, process and kind of just confronting those kinds of things that were even now I'm using that act that is escapism to deal with that subject as to escape and to think about it. And just trying to bring them back and just have that moment for me, you know, the, the father of the father of the just explaining the pain is for me. All right. Thank you. 
Um, your artwork is so late in time, right? The sound of the past and then the constructions of these worlds for the future. What would you say is the most pleasant thing about your artwork? I think that I, I tend to um, draw on my people around me, like as characters, but uh, now I'm going to still care for that one. Spirits rushing out and kind of using things that I you know have in private, like people around me as subject, or even sometimes if I work in good games like a game of play or a movie I watch or something, but it's like the shock of being crazy sometimes and then spend so bad through the process of like working for my work or visiting. Um, so I was noticing that a lot of your your drawn work and your painted work, aside from your ceramics, really, that you work on a lot of like rectangles and squares. Do you think about like the shape of your canvas or? Yeah, bring I, that up? I like the square. I feel like with the square is quite contemporary because it had a lot of grid systems throughout like technology and even like how us artists have to professionally use have to use square. That are best, and then you see all your work and they're chopped up and they're real. Like, you know, all these social media and stuff like that. And also, I think it takes me back to like, you know, like my dad introduced me to computers. I remember I was, I was going, I was going on the internet and I would download these little, uh, like from the big games, they're called sprites, and it's a little asset that was like the animation, the full animation of the game. It showed you each step in like little bits, like little tiny squares. So Zoom in, and I see that this is made out of just my you know, my little images. I think Jake has just kind of grabbed them and just fit the bitmaps, right? So you can just like kind of see those underlying systems. It kind of makes me think about it. So you want to come back to that. Kind of come back. Um, I don't know. I mean, no questions from online. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Ryan.